Well, hello everybody, this is John Michael, and it's great to speak to you from my inner room, from, from my hermitage. And thank you for letting me come into the hermitage of your heart and of your life. Uh, I have with me uh, Father John Bear. This is going to continue from last week as our bonus material in the school. Father John, uh, I, I, I did an interview with Sister Vasa Laren uh, a couple, I guess about a month and a half, two months ago. And the first thing I told her, I said, I'm utterly outclassed. So I'm standing in the shadow of a giant. And, and if you were to see him stand up, he is a, he's 6'8". So, but, but Father John is brilliant. He's spiritual. I believe that he's um, from the place of ancient tradition. Father John is taking us into the future and, and kind of blowing our minds a little bit. And I love it. So good to have you here again, Father John. Good to be with you. Okay, and we're going to pick it up. Yeah. Um, so we spoke about my background, my formation, yes. and we ended up with studying the Metropolitan Canisters, going through the tradition, and did my doctoral thesis, and I came to St. Vladimir's and met Father Thomas Hopko, right. who's a passionate preacher from mm. the Gospel, mm. about Christ, about the Scriptures. Was he a great preacher? Oh, fantastic. <sighs> yeah. Have you ever heard him? No. Oh, there's plenty of things online. I'm just, I'm just a oh, dumb okay. Roman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But one of my, one of my pet peeves, in the Catholic Church, is we need great preaching. Yeah. Our oh, preacher, our preachers are getting better. They are getting better. Mm -hmm. But I, for 20 mm -hmm. years, I've been saying, come on, guys, don't just get up there and spout off yeah. ideas. No, it's got Share be, your heart. It's got to be the gospel. It's yeah. got to be Christ. It's got to be scriptural. Yeah. It's got to come from here, yeah. you know, come from yeah. your life. Yeah. And faith responds to faith. Mm -hmm. If you share your faith, the yeah. faith of the people in the pews really is, is built up. Yeah. So, yeah. great preacher, huh? Yeah. Yes. So, when I came to St. Vladimir's, and we are, so we are continuing from last week, but it will take into a whole other dimension with this. When I came to St. Vladimir's, although I had a doctorate from Oxford, done with Metropolitan Callistos, yeah. on Irenaeus and Clement, I had to do a master's. <laughs> <laughs> because he had a requirement that all the faculty should have a degree from an orthodox theological institution. Ah. Yeah, and, and I fully appreciate that. I totally sure. endorse it, sure. because a school's got a, line, a theological life of its own, and you have to come to know that. And if you come from outside, what better way to do it? Now, were you, also, able, were you able to teach while you were getting your master's? Oh, yeah. So I'd be okay. sitting down for one class and standing up for the other class. <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was fun. And, you know, I love learning. And so I'd never studied formally things like liturgy or canon law. So just be able to go through it. Right, right. You know, right. As to my knowledge. But then for my doctoral thesis, so for my, for my master thesis for that, I decided I'd do a translation of Irenaeus' work mm. called The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching. Yeah, it's only in Armenian, but that's a different question. <laughs> so I was struggling with it, Armenian. I was struggling with it for a year, translating it. And it's a really simple text, but what really, really bugged me during the whole time was why does he call it the demonstration of the apostolic preaching, yet he never quotes the New Testament? Wow. And I think that was really the kernel which, which lies at the base of all my subsequent work. Right. Yeah, apostolic preaching is preaching Christ according to the scriptures. Mm. Period. Before there's a New Testament, you've got the scriptures. And really the model... Let me for... pause right here. <laughs> okay. Now, for some of us in this school, we have, maybe not intellectually, but we have a gut level kind of belief that the New Testament kind of just went bang from heaven, kind of like the Book of Mormon or something like that. Uh, and, and the whole notion that, that the New Testament wasn't even in existence for the earliest fathers of the church is mind-blowing. And it, and it undergirds the whole notion that if you're going to understand Scripture, you've got to understand the fathers who preach Scripture from yeah. the Hebrew text, yeah. or the Hebrew but, Scripture. But, but let me make it even more precise, to be very clear about our terms. From, we are so used to a book called the Bible now. Yeah. We, we, we just presume it. Yeah. In a way, 
the Apostle Paul didn't have the Bible, right? Yeah, or the Evangelists, or and the way we've got it printed now, we've got Old Testament, New Testament, right? And that automatically makes you think all of this material, the Old Testament, is Old, Old. Testament. It's all the things that happened before coming of Christ. If you want to know about Christ, right. turn to the New Testament, right? right. Well, as I was reading Irenaeus and these really early fathers. So, you know, the writings of Paul and the Gospels had been written 20, 30, whatever years after Christ, mm -hmm. but they hadn't quite come to, together to be a New Testament. Right. Yeah? Right. They're, they're, they're circulating, people know them, but they're not thought of in that way yet. So they're still preaching Christ through the Scriptures. And then it really dawned on me that the model for that is actually what we've got in the road to Emmaus. Hmm. So just taking those Gospel narratives, yeah. it is so clear. The disciples are with him, they do not get who he is. Right. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John is always slightly different. But Matthew, mm. Mark, and Luke, mm. apart from Peter, mm. when Peter on the road to Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16 says, you are the Christ, son of the living God, Christ says, well, you didn't know this by flesh and blood. It's not by seeing me, you know, as a physical object, physical. six foot tall and so on, that you got this. It's by a revelation from the Father. And then he says, on this rock, I'll build my church, whatever you bind, whatever you lose. Then he says, by the way, Peter, I've got to go to Jerusalem to suffer. <laughs> And Peter says, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> and Christ says, get behind me, Satan, Satan. The only disciple before the Passion who makes his full confession about who Christ is gets called Satan. Right. Yeah, the one he's just been told, you're the rock, I'll build my church on this rock, and the gates will never prevail. Satan. <laughs> Two verses later. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets called Satan very simply because he tries to stop Christ going to the cross. The cross. Okay. So it's the exception which proves the rule. They don't get it. They see him on the cross, they run away in fear and deny right, him. Right. They see the empty tomb, they don't get it. Right. You know, what's right. happened? Think about it, an, an empty tomb is ambiguous. Right. What does it mean that it's empty? The women turn up and say, well, has someone stolen the body? What's going on here? Yeah. It takes an angel to explain to him, don't you remember what he said, that he had rise? Now go tell his disciples that he'll meet them in Galilee. Huh. The women go back and tell the disciples, and the disciples say, ah, you're crazy, <laughs> you got up too early this morning, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Then on the road, classically, on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, the risen Christ turns up. Not only do they not recognise him, they say, who are you? You stranger? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you heard what's been going on? Haven't you heard about this Jesus we thought he was going to save us when he got himself killed, the tomb's empty? We've got no idea. Yeah, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm playing it up, obviously, just to just make the point. Because the fundamental point is then, um, he opens the scriptures. Right. Yeah, Moses and the prophets, and shows how Moses and all the prophets spoke about how he had to suffer to enter into his glory. Right. right. And then the second point is, their hearts start to burn, they persuade him to stay the night, he breaks bread, they recognise him in the break of the bread, their eyes are open, they recognise him, and he disappears and from sight. Gone. Right. Yeah? And that really is a whole kernel out of which everything then develops. Yeah? So you've got were always concentrated upon the crucified and risen Christ. Right. If you try and understand Christ in any other way, uh, by getting back to what he was doing before the cross, right. well, you, you deserve the rebu rebuke of Peter. Yeah. Get behind me, Satan. Satan. You separated Christ from the cross. Mm -hmm. It's a crucified and risen one. And we know him by the opening of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. Yeah? And that's what we still do today. When mm -hmm. we come to church, the scriptures are open. The liturgy of the word. Well, but, but in all of it, not just liturgy of the word, but you know, in, I would say really everything. The, you have the reading, you have um, the hymnography, which is made up of a tapestry of scriptural scriptures. imagery or whatever. Right. You have um, the iconography. Right. You have the ritual. Right. All of that is an opening of the scriptures. Right. Yeah, it's all enacting the opening of the scriptures, which really means that the, the place we come to that we call church is not referring to the the the, 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 build, the, the walls. Right. It's this space. The, the word created is not quite right. Formed by the opening of the scriptures, a matrix yes. of all of this interscriptural imagery, references, readings, and all the rest of it. And of course, matrix means it's a Latin. I'm sure everybody. I'm sure every time I ask this, people always immediately think about Hollywood. Yes. yes, the Matrix film, you know, behind, yeah. behind or whatever, yeah. You watch which, out. which pill are you going to take? I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of that, all of that. But Matrix simply means it's a Latin word for womb. Right. So this is the womb. This is why the church is our mother, <laughs> mm. in which we are born mm. again, putting on the identity of Christ. 
So when we come to church, we are on the road to Emmaus with the scriptures opened up, culminating in the breaking of the bread, which we eat and we become his body, right. which is why it disappears from sight. Right. So that's that fabric of it all. That, that's a matrix of it all. And it's the scriptures. Mm. Yeah. And in fact, both those points go back to Paul. You know, Paul, the first person to start writing, the, mm -hmm. the apostle to start writing, before right. there's a gospel, before Luke, and Luke's his disciple, right. he uses a particular formula twice. He says, Christ died and rose in accordance with Scripture. In fact, Corinthians 15, he says, Christ died in accordance with Scripture, rose in accordance with Scripture. So important is that scriptural thing. He says it twice in one sentence. Mm. And then in chapter 11, 1124, he says, uh, I deliver to you what I received, right. that, Christ, uh, that in the night which is given up, took bread, break it, do this in remembrance of me. Right. Right. That formula, I deliver to you what I received. Yeah. It's a scriptural understanding of Christ and the breaking of bread. And those are the two fundamental means by which we encounter the crucified and risen one, mm -hmm. which means it's always happening in the present. We're not at a disadvantage by not having been back there 2,000 years ago, because those who were there 2,000 years ago saw the cross and saw the empty tomb, didn't get it anyway. Right, right. Yeah? So for me, um, being forced to go back, so not having, you know, been educated in whole theological systems, and, and this is how you do Old Testament exegesis and so on, yeah. going back to Irenaeus, having learned how to read and think, and just looking at what he's doing and how he's doing mm -hmm. it, how he's reading the scripture, how he's presenting Christ through the scriptures. Yeah. Melito, we read that the other day, does the same thing. In, in this week, there are two takeaways that I get. I think everybody gets their own, mm -hmm. but these are mine. Uh, <clears throat> and I think they're important. Is that we tend to read what we are doing now yeah. as Roman Catholics, as Orthodox, as Baptists, you know, it doesn't matter. We read back and project what we are yeah. based on them. And we use them as proofs yeah. or apologetic proofs for yeah. what we're doing. And I think what you're saying is to, no, go back and get where they are and then come yeah. out. Yeah. Now, interestingly, that would be a really neat, in, uh, correct and precise way of putting together what the... Orthodox tradition the East has preserved, but also benefiting from what the West has learned through Enlightenment. Hmm. In this sense. Yeah. Okay, in this sense. What we always tend to do is we start with what we think we know. Right. As you're saying, we, 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 know, we, we know Christian theology, it's got Trinitarian theology, it's got incarnation, it's got Mariology, it's got oh. ecclesiology, hamatology, creation, all these different things. We think we, you know, all these different pieces. And then we go back and read the tradition, the early fathers, mm -hmm. for things that correspond to areas that we think we, you know, that we already have. Yeah. Yeah. So we know Trinitarian theology. Well, you go and look at the Cappadocians of Trinitarian theology. Right. Like, as if when they were writing, they thought they were writing, okay, we're writing about Trinitarian theology, we'll leave Christology to the next century. Yeah. No, they weren't doing that at all. Yeah. 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 Um, so what we've in fact done in, modern, in, in modernity is we've extracted the theological reflection out of the exegetical context, liturgical context, and ascetic context in which it took shape. Mm -hmm. And that exegetical context is primarily reading the scriptures, what we now call the Old Testament, to speak about Christ. Mm -hmm. We've taken it out of that and we've combined it with a different way of reading scripture, mm -hmm. Old Testament. All things in the past, New Testament, and it doesn't quite fit, okay? But we, we've got it so firmly ingrained in our mind that this is how it all works, and yeah. then we read the tradition for this. Yeah. But I'm also a product of the West, right? Okay, and so I've learned to do rigorous, disciplined historical study, right? And so when I read Irenaeus or Athanasius or Maximus or whoever, I'm going to apply. All that I've learned from the Enlightenment, from historical scholarship, to understand Irenaeus on his own terms, mm -hmm. as a witness to the faith in his context. Right. Yeah. Right. Rather than just being, you know, he contributed this part of the theology, they contributed that part. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you're not listening to any of them. Yeah. So what, I'm, what we're doing is to go back and we're, we're trying to encounter Irenaeus and see things the way he did it 
fully. And then, um, for me, it would be Origen, question of status for Origen, but sure, sure. phenomenal figure, then Athanasius, then Basil, then Gregory, then Max, Cyril. Max, we say he's the first great theologian. He absolutely is, yeah. in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Uh, but, but we don't have to get into the status of that. The, the point is, you, you've got these historical witnesses to the faith. Mm. And you're using the discipline of history to break down your preconceptions and to try and understand what they're doing on their terms, mm -hmm. which is really difficult to read Athanasius on the Incarnation. Yeah, on, on his terms. On his terms, yeah. yeah. So, um, to read Athanasius on the Incarnation. Right. We all think we know what Incarnation means. Right. Second person of the Trinity, the Word of God is born of Mary and becomes, becomes flesh. Yeah. Not realising we've just put together the, the prologue of John, which doesn't talk about a birth, <laughs> at least not for the word, it talks about a, a birth for those who receive him, right. together with the infant scenarios which don't talk about the word of God. Right. Mm. And Athanasius doesn't talk about any of that anyway. He talks about how the one on the cross is the word of God, as we yes. just went through the last week. Yes. The one on the cross yes. is the word of God, and we are his body. So that's what he means by incarnation, but because we think we already know, no. we no. don't read him. Right. So, we, so what we think he is. Yeah. So, you know, Metropolitan Callistos once suggested that one should treat patristic texts as if they're icons. Mm. Yeah. Don't impose your vision on them. Let them inform mm. your vision. Right. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean you then repeat. It doesn't mean you just repeat what they said. Right. No. But you, reading through each one and trying to see each one on their own terms, his own terms, um, you then get formed. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're learning under the tutelage of Irenaeus. You're learning under the tutelage of him, of him, of him, all the way through. And you are being formed in that. Yeah. And then when you, when you do that, you can actually look back and see the whole history and tradition of the church as being a symphony. Ah. Yeah. Rather than a synthesis, rather than making a synthesis of everything into your own system now and fitting everybody into it, right. or bits of everybody into it. No, it's a symphony, and the thing which characterizes a symphony is that there is polyphonous, there's many voices. Right. And there's many voices at any given time, synchron synchronically, right. and across time, right. diachronically. Right. Okay, so technically, and I don't use jargon by and large, but I like this, it's, it's synchronic and diachronic polyphony. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> synchronic and diachronic polyphony. And then the point of engaging with it is if you want to sing in that symphony, if you want to take part in a symphony, you've got to go over the score of the earlier movements. Right. That's what you do. Right. Yeah? right. And especially the earliest movement where it gets going. Right. Yeah? Where, where, the, where the discourse is set right. or however you want to put it. Yeah? Right. And then by, by going through the movement of the earlier parts of the symphony, you can take your part today... And it may well be different than what went before, but to be part of the same symphony. And, and, each conductor brings their own interpretation. Well, of uh, yeah, yeah, and so, but, but we then are not the conductor of the no. whole symphony. God's the conductor. God is the so conductor. So by, by going through that, <clears throat> we now do our part, sing our part today, um, which means that the whole symphony is not my construction, it's God's construction. Absolutely. Avenir talks about it as... Um, God is harmonizing us to the symphony yeah. of salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. So that's, you know, bringing everything that the West has learned through enlightenment and nationality and historicism and all of that, which can be detrimental. And in some ways it has been detrimental when applied to scriptural scholarship or scriptural exegesis, but bring it to bear on the tradition of the church and seeing a symphony of witnesses, but that requires disciplined study. When I was a very young Jesus person, in the Jesus movement, uh, and I started hanging out with a, a very wise American Baptist pastor. And he says, John, he says, it's important to do exegesis and not eisegesis. Yeah. That, that you don't take your idea and project it onto scripture, you let scripture inform you. Yeah. And I think we have to do that with the whole of Yeah, Patricius. but, but, but there, there, there are two things. I would fully differentiate the writings of scripture from the writings right. of the Father. Right. They're not they're not scripture. No. And so I'll understand them in historical terms. In historical terms. Yeah. I'm not going to do that for Isaiah. I'm not going to try right. and figure out what Isaiah really might have meant back <clears throat> in the sixth century yeah. BC yeah. because to go back to what we were talking about earlier, the fundamental dynamic 
is that in the light of Christ, the veil is lifted, right. or the book is opened, or all the other imagery you can talk about, and now you're reading scripture differently, but you're yeah. still reading the same text. And it's yeah? the cross. You're, and you're reading it as speaking about this one. We're going to break here. Uh, we're going to come back and do another one, because we're not done. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you for letting us come from my inner room to your inner room. And I hope as you listen, you might be hearing words that you don't understand. Look them up. Look them up. Uh, learn. Learn. Father John is really one of the best. And he's utterly orthodox. And I think he's challenging not only for his own faith tradition in Christianity, but for Catholics as well. I love you guys. Remember, when you look at these words and you think you can't do it, all things are possible with God.